Welcome to The Gray Report. I am Matt Bossongo filling in for Spencer Gray. I've got some great stuff today to talk about here on the economy, on multifamily, and on housing, specifically from the CPI. We're going to go over the, the latest news about inflation. Good news, it's getting lower. Um, and then from CBRE, they have a great article about the prospects of investing at the start of a rate cut cycle. And then a look at the multifamily market from um, RealPage, Yardi Matrix, and Apartment List, all of them on the same market, but a little bit different takes for each of them. And finally, then we'll look at housing sentiment from Fannie Mae. We'll sprinkle in some commentary on the recent jobs report. And um, we're going to give you guys a great a take on the latest and most important information, data, research on the multifamily market, the macro economy, and housing. Stick around for a great report. Let's get into it. Welcome back. To the Gray Report, we, I am joined again by the my esteemed colleague, the Chief Investment Officer at Gray Capital, Jay Reader. Um, he he did such an excellent job. We had him back, and um, and I know it's not as great with Spencer not here, but I think that we got an excellent excellent episode lined up for us. All right, we're in October. It's time for a pinch hitter. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> even my even my son's talking about the talking about baseball, and it's like, all right, I got to learn about another another new sport. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just want to jump into things and we can start talking about the CPI. You know, I almost didn't cover it this week because it did seem like maybe, um, you know, maybe with interest rates lower and with the Fed, hopefully, you know, um, be uh, kind of moving on their lower interest or on uh, yeah on their lower interest rate trajectory, maybe CPI wasn't as relevant. Um, but I still think that even though it may not be the headline news it once was, it is uh, it, it's worth following. I think it's worth following, and like we said, we knew that Fed was going to cut rates when I was on with you last time was kind of mm -hmm. the announcement of that. Um, but I think one of the things that we've seen lately is that even though we kind of have assumed rates are going to go lower, if you look over the last 30 days on the 10 years, 10 years gone up. Yeah. And so I think there's kind of a disconnect now. It's like we always kind of assumed short-term rates were going to go down and just we were going to have down rates in general, but I think we're kind of sunny, trying to see that stabilization that we've seen historically of, hey, short-term rates are a little bit lower, longer-term rates going up a little bit longer. So I think we're kind of in that equilibrium now where we yeah. start seeing that. It is weird. And it's like maybe we're, we're, we're kind of talking about the magnitude of the next rate hike or, or the next rate cut and 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 the timing of that is now makes the cpi relevant maybe they'll cut it or not cut it now and cut it later um so it's still a little bit a little bit relevant it's just not like alarm bells as it, as it used to be um but it's good news um inflation lower from 2.5 percent to 2.4 percent year over year core inflation did tick up slightly from from 3.2 to 3.3 growth year over year so it's not like 100 percent um, great here for lower prices, but I'll take the tiny decrease in overall inflation um, as a good, you know, that's, that's a meaningful, some, some meaningful progress towards the Fed's 2% target. Um, and then the quote here from, from the press release from the Bureau of Labor Statistics is that indexes which increased in September include shelter, which I'll get to in a second, motor vehicle insurance, medical care, apparel, and airline fares. The indexes for recreation and communication were among those that decreased over the month. Great news for multifamily specifically, rent growth, um, as measured by the CPI, is finally, finally starting to change here. I'm going to bring up a chart here of the overall, so we'll get this uh, we'll get this screen grab here of the um, of the chart. You know, so I've got here lines for it, and let's let's get rid of core inflation and just look at shelter here. So it's it says shelter is now I've got this cover. So it shows shelter ticking down actually. Um, it ticked down from 5.2 to, I'm sorry, from 5.2 to 4.9%, which, which I think is a meaningful, is a meaningful decrease in inflation. And, um, and it shows how, how even though a constituent part of inflation is helping rise it, the decrease in that makes me hopeful for the future. Um, maybe it's false hope, but I, I still, still think it's a hope nonetheless. And you'll, and we'll see um, now in, in the case shiller numbers, and we're, we're, we'll talk about home price growth in a little bit later. 
But when we're talking about home price growth or rent growth, those are both going down. And I think there's signs that they could continue to go down. There are There's some talk of maybe we'll see a dip in home prices moving forward. And that's something that I think is not out of the question is for home prices to, you know, before before rate cuts kind of change the game in, uh, and change people's attitudes, I think that we could see um, – we could see home price growth getting getting a little bit lower because you know it takes a little bit a little bit of time for mortgage rates and for the market to kind of adjust whether it's whether it's housing market or uh, multifamily market but um but we're going to see, you know, they'll go back up. It's just we're in this weird time at the beginning of a rate cycle, which we'll get to in uh, in that CBRE article. I think it could be an exciting time, also a very scary time <laughs> because you don't quite know, you know, we don't quite know exactly what's going to happen. And the timing of it could really mean that mistakes could be made. And so without the certainty of like a, a large amount of people being confident about this, without the excitement, whether it's in the housing market or the multifamily market, we're left with, you know, uh, kind of a guessing game. Uh, you can be confident, but there's there's some risk is, is my point. Um, specifically about rent growth. Sorry, I had that whole preamble there. Month over month, we saw a 0.3% change. Now, that's larger than we're seeing in rent growth privately, right? We're seeing negative, uh, we're seeing negative percentage points sometimes for monthly for monthly growth. And then for yearly growth, we're definitely like a lot of them at zero or like negative 1% close to that um, when we're talking about rent growth for two, for 2024. Now, when we're looking at Bureau of Labor Statistics for rent growth, we're still at 4.8%. So there's a lot to fall. There's a, a, a big uh, a big gap between what we're seeing in the private trackers and what we're seeing in the Bureau of Labor Statistics. That's been the case for like two years. It's so, I, so I'm kind of celebrating this because we're finally seeing like a consistent amount of evidence showing this decline of rent growth. However, we're not there yet. So, you know, my point still stands. I'm just a little bit excited that things are finally coming into parity where it's not like the sky is red all of a sudden and now it's turning blue. We're maybe... You know, we're maybe it's still a little bit purple. <laughs> uh, so let me let let's just show the charts here for um, for rent growth, and I want to show the specifically the rent growth by um, so this is rent of primary residence in in uh, U.S. city average is the specific name for it. This is monthly rent growth that we're looking at, and we're seeing how each month during like the peak rent growth, uh, as measured by the CPI, in from May to, for from June 2022 until February of 2023, we saw like upwards of 0.7, 0.8% rent growth um, every every month, and that and that really built up. So that was really the peak period. Now it has gone down since then, and now we're at. 0.3%. Really, actually, I guess specifically, it's 0.27%. Now, we were at 0.26% in June, then it shot up in July and uh, to 5%. And now it's actually back down to 0.3% again. My point is, it's not it's not the the jumps that we're seeing. It is the longer track from from this early 2023 peak down to this mid late 2024 low. And um, it's gone down quite a bit, and I think that's a promising sign that you can see this now. This is where I urge the listeners to to watch the YouTube video because um, my garbled explanation of this line graph really, um, it's really not represented. It's a better just to look at the graph and see that we had a big hump in, uh, a couple of years, you know, a year and a half ago, and we are we have definitely gone down from that hump. However, if let's just edit this graph and change it to a percent change from a year ago, and it'll show how we're, we've still got long a long way to go. But that's it. But again, you know, we saw how we peaked in March 2023 at what was that sky high number? 8.8 percent rent of primary residence. And now we're down to 4.9, 4.78 percent um, in September 2024. So progress with this. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the things to kind of highlight here is the difference between the growth of housing versus the Fed's target of inflation, because people who've been in this industry for a long time hadn't see it. Like the old number for rent growth was just 3%. Yeah. Oh it yeah. It wasn't 2%. Um, maybe 2% was more realistic, but I think the idea of 3% growth. So we're still at 4% growth year yeah. over year. So we're still seeing good growth. I don't, I think when we're talking about it coming down, it's not like, Oh, all of a sudden growth is going to go negative. I think it's just coming down relative to yeah, where yeah. we were previously, which was very, very high. But even now where we are today, we're still higher than we were in 
2019, 2020, obviously 2020. Yeah, you could definitely did. see in this in this chart. That's a good point. So the average, you know, for let's let's just take for like from 2016 to like 2019, it was in the upper threes. It was like 3.7, 3.8, 3.9. Um, you know, in January 2029, it was 3.4. But I've I've always heard the rule of thumb is like three and a half percent. Um, and may, and that may be you know uh like a little bit more optimistic, but that's always like what the the typical rule of thumb is that I've heard. And now it does you know we've got a we've got about a percent and a half of that to go I think before we get comfortable. And so I I would say from affordability standpoint for consumers, obviously great news that it's coming down. But I think when we look at it from our side, we look at it still true of like assets that we're invested in, we're still able to grow that. Now I think that's where we compare that against CPI. And some of those core things that are expenses for us on apartments. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yep. How does that how does that rent growth compare to what we're spending on our other properties? Because yeah. if we're not outpacing, then all the rent growth in the world doesn't help us. Yeah. And so that's where I think kind of understanding all of the different ses- segments of that CPI and what's growing, what's coming down, mm-hmm. and we're able to kind of do that. And I think it will get into it later when we talk about jobs, but employment and what people are doing for a living yeah. and living there. But then even for us on an operation side of our vendors, what what is the opportunities for vendors? Are vendors raising their prices because they can't get people to work for them? They have more work than what they have people yeah. doing. Yeah. And so I think that kind of all of those kind of aspects feed into what we're doing on a day to day basis here. Yep. Oh, I, I completely agree. I was even asking um, I was asking our director of maintenance, Joe Powell, about about expenses and how he would maybe uh, describe last year versus this year. And, you know, he did note that like the the timeline of, of where a project is can definitely like skews how much you're spending on it. So it's hard to get like a apples and apples to apples comparison because you're either, you know, at a building phase or a renovation phase or you're not. And and so, so that's, but I asked him, you know, if, how much was for, for a given price of something, was the price change between 2023 and 2024 as dramatic as 22 to 23? And he said, basically, the prices from 23 to 24 have grown at a normal rate, not as surprising as 22 to 23. Is that something that you noticed too? Or I think we've definitely seen a leveling out. And I think one of the things that we've internally kind of seen is we've had some big projects going on. And yeah. so we've been able... I. I say that we've kind of seen some good pricing, but we've also had a lot of scale on our pricing. We haven't had a lot of one-off type things. I mean, we've had a property where we had to replace 100 HVAC, so it's a lot easier to say, hey, we're going to give you a job for 100 units to go do that than it is, hey, I need need to replace an emergency HVAC where all of a sudden they're picking up and trying to fit you in with all of their other jobs. And so they've got to increase the price all that. Whereas like, hey, I've got jobs for the next two months. I can... I'm not worried about where my next deal is going to come from. I'm working for you guys. And so we have a little bit of power on pricing there. So we've seen that specifically on day-to-day operations here yeah. more so than maybe we've seen in previous years. Okay. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I did talk to, uh, talked to Joe yesterday about, uh, you know, they're putting a new refrigerants now. There's going to be a new refrigerant law. And that means that all these HVAC units. I said we just made the we finalized the switch from R twenty twos to four ten A's and now they're changing it again. <laughs> Jeez. All right, great. That's just great. So all the juice that runs your HVACs, it seems like they change them every ten years. And you and I and I like the new I like that the new stuff is this is my joke that I was saying yesterday. Uh it's like the new stuff is more flammable. But it's less pollution, so it's like it's concentrating all of that pollution and risk. <laughs> it's gonna, things are going to get really hot, really close to it if it explodes. But it's safer for the in the general environment. So it's global warming or really hot, really hot warming right there. Um, but no, I think that that's that is that's a factor. I think that uh, that asset managers should are probably tracking right is and and man, it seems like some of the biggest costs for uh, for apartment units. Our, um, our air conditioning and just maintaining those. And, and it's really important, obviously, that's, you know, you can't, it's expensive too. <laughs> well, and I think, I think there's a lot of costs. I mean, um, to say one of Joe's famous sayings is mm-hmm. it's really expensive to not know what's going on. Exactly. Oh, and, yeah. And one of the things that we've struggled with specifically is because of wage growth, I think we've had to, we've taken a while kind of on the operations to understand how that factors into employees at our sites and understanding where that's taking people and being able to hire good people mm-hmm. in the industry. And so when you're hiring new people, that means you don't have people on site. So that means you're subcontracting out a lot more work. You're trying to 
be the lowest priority for someone and pay to be the highest priority. Mm -hmm. And when you're constantly doing that, it's kind of an uphill battle. Once you have scale, once you have a stable workforce and you're working on those things, then all of a sudden you can see what the real numbers are. Yeah. But yeah. as you said, an asset manager, it's their job to know which level are you in. And I, I would say we were in a period where we were growing and kind of getting our systems in place. Yeah. And yeah. Now that we kind of have those systems in place and we're seeing what kind of that recurring job force does to help our properties, yeah. I think we, yeah. it, it really gives us a clear picture. No, that's a good point. You know, you reminded me about, I'm pulling up the jobs report now, um, about how relevant labor is and how relevant labor is not only just the cost of it, but like to keep people that are trained and to, you know, the, and to keep the quality people and to make sure that there's not turnover. And, um, and just, um, it's hard. <laughs> that, that was one thing that I got out of my conversations with, with Joe yesterday is it's a difficult thing because sometimes the turnover is, is difficult. And sometimes it is just, um, it's, it's difficult to find someone period. And, um, and it's hard to, to manage a lot of people in these different sites. So yeah, it's labor in, in specifically, I think talent is, uh, is, is worthwhile. It's worth paying for. Right? And, and, and I think Joe, I wish we had Joe here to talk to this. <laughs> I know. We, we talked about this too. And one of the things that people have always kind of said in the apartment industry is there's kind of this correlation between construction jobs and maintenance jobs. Mm -hmm. Of like when construction's really, really high, those maintenance guys are going to go search for those uh, construction okay. jobs yeah. and try to get that a little bit more. When those jobs aren't as plentiful, then a lot of those guys are like, well, what can I do with my skill set? I, well, I can run maintenance on apartments. Mm -hmm. uh, but Joe's really good about talking about like, the same guy that you have that's framing your house is not the same guy that's going to be coming and fixing your HVAC. Yeah, yeah. So we kind of generalize like, oh yeah, these construction guys are going to come do that. But there is a specific skill set that's required in that Yeah, that we have to factor in. It's like, oh, we can't just take any guy off the construction site that's looking for a job and put them on our property and expect that they're going to be able to get the job done. And again, that was what I was, that was exactly what I was thinking of. He he described to me a project that he did have. He went in and, and they, you know, he had to go and manage these apartments and he he kind of specialized people. He's like, I'm going to train you for drywall. I'm going to train you for, you know, for this kind of construction thing. I'm going to train these guys on maintenance and never the two shall meet. <laughs> I don't think it was that like it was that separate, but but it was very much important to keep the maintenance going to make sure that they're not that they're not trying to turn an apartment, that they are like actually maintaining things as they go and not trying to bleed into construction and and also Conversely, that the construction projects keep going, and then and they're not trying to dip out and, and you know turn their fix a AC unit or something like that. So I think the specialization and that that leads into like kind of training and and it's sad because you know if you lose someone that did have that training or if if Joe as Joe mentioned like maybe they forget training, <laughs> which is I think it's all I, I do think though um, you know with management anywhere anytime it's about spinning plates. You know it, you just have to check up on people. You have to keep make sure that they're accountable. You have to make sure n not only that they're working hard, but they're, they're working right. Um, I've, I've seen this description that Joe has said of like, you can spend two hours fixing an AC unit. You're working the whole time, but if it only really needs 15 minutes, then that's fine. Or, or what he said yesterday, he was like, you know, I had a guy that was making sure that this, that this turn unit was pristine every, you know, it was like a Da Vinci paint. Now this is me, <laughs> uh, but it was like, you no, know, that, that unit was good enough. Like a couple hours ago, you you know that you need to know when good enough is is good enough so that you can do more um, with with other apartments. So you know it's it's the standards, it's the things that you're looking for, and um, and I keep thinking of, too about like yeah the the two dollar park versus the two thousand uh, dollar versus the two thousand dollar AC right. unit. So yeah, that's that's really important. But um, just to kind of zoom right back out to jobs in general, I have this jobs report here and. Um, and we've got um, it was positive. It, a lot of people got got pretty excited about this, or not excited if you're if you're someone that's looking for someone that's looking for uh, lower interest rates, I guess. But it, they did go down. You know, un unemployment numbers went from four point three to four point one. That's great. Um, I don't know what was your take on the jobs report. I mean, I think we kind of knew that jobs have been good. I mean, if, if we're looking even internally here, of like. OK, trying to fill fill jobs, we can have postings up for a long time and maybe not get the candidates that we want. So I think we know that people have jobs. Um, I think where I've kind of been wondering is like at a certain point, like we're growing jobs a lot every month. And at some point, 
how, how do we continue to grow jobs? Like, I know. <laughs> I, if unemployment is 3% and we're chipping away and it's lower each month and we're growing through jobs, like at a certain point, like it's got to go back the other way. And so maybe we're close to an equilibrium, but I think at some point, I mean, we can create jobs, but if we're creating jobs, we're also probably losing jobs at some point. Yeah, well, yeah. I think the best example of that would be the strike that we saw for the longshoremen. I mean, mm -hmm. they had that strike basically to ensure that they didn't lose their jobs to automation. This, and that was, I had that pegged <laughs> the minute that strike started, I was like, they're going to figure a way out of it <laughs> because it's too close to an election to have that just dangling out there. But, and so, and so like, those are jobs that were kept, but those are jobs that could potentially go away in the future. And yep, so I think yep. really understanding kind of where, where the cheese is moving to mm -hmm. when it comes to the jobs that people actually have and the jobs that people need, because uh, when I was thinking about the jobs report, all I'm hearing is about all of this call back to work and like, Hey, basically they're making people come back into work, whether it's Dell, whether it's Amazon. Mm -hmm. And it's basically like, essentially a soft layoff because they know there are people that aren't going to want to come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're just letting people say, Hey, you can go if you're not going to come back into the office. Mm -hmm. And so we do hear about some of those jobs, but then on the same time, ask anyone who is looking for a contractor on their house or some sort of plumber or electrician. Yeah. Hey, I'm booked three days out. I'm booked yeah, two weeks yeah. out. And so I think understanding where the job creation is coming from, is it in white collar office jobs like an Amazon, like a mm -hmm. Dell, like all of those things? Or is it more blue collar in the trades and understanding kind of where those, yeah, where those yeah. changes are coming from? No, that's good. Um, I just, I just thought it was worth noting here. I didn't, I didn't have a full write up for it, but um, this is the, this is the chart that has scared me in the past. Um, just looking at the patterns and I've, I referenced this on a previous episode of the gray report. I tried to, I want, what I wanted to do was, uh, was show my, um, was show my kids this chart and say, okay, if you follow this pattern, what do you think is going to happen next? Because it always seems like it goes down and then it goes up and it goes down and it goes up. And and why wouldn't it go up again? And um, I know that there are points where it doesn't. There was a point, let's look here. Um, it does seem like this point in the 60s or maybe, you know, this point in the 90s, perhaps. Like there are times when it didn't, it didn't always, it, where uh, unemployment didn't always spike right back up after a period of being low. But um, it's hard to argue against like 50 plus years of of this cycle in which at once in, unemployment goes up a little, it tends to spike up a lot. Um, and I don't know. Obviously, pandemic is, is different. Obviously, the the changes in unemployment that we saw during the pandemic, look at this spike in, in you know, and we've referenced again before um, in April twenty. 20 has you know that was huge but still like i keep coming back to is are we at the start of a more difficult period i don't know i don't know and i think one thing to kind of look at specifically with this and i think the spike in 2020 really does kind of make it real hard to really gauge but if you look at that and you trend it yeah. you take out that spike mm -hmm. that is a very long trough at the bottom of that graph compared yeah. to where it's been in other that's times. a good point yeah 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 so it's so it, if it does go up it could be more of a hill if you just eliminate that spike it didn't really go down it's more gradually and it could have like bottomed out at the at in between this gap you know um but yeah, no, I, and I remember you mentioning this was this was years ago um, during, you know, the early moments of the pandemic where like we were maybe due for a, uh, a recession in the in in like late 2019. And if you look at anything that's ever happened with the jobs, like mm -hmm. I, obviously two consecutive quarters of negative growth, obviously that correlates with something. Well, if you look at every time on that graph that we have yeah. job loss, it's during a recession. Yeah. Yeah. And so. We've talked about, mm -hmm. hey, is this going to be a soft landing? Is it going to be a recession? Is it going to be a technical recession that we don't really feel too much? Yeah. Like, what what are those aspects? And I think once we see if we do kind of fall into any of those categories, do we get the soft landing and that's much more leveled out? Mm -hmm. Do we actually get it, even if it's technical? Is that number going to shoot back up? Because if we're looking at it, every time that we have a recession, that's where the pop is. Yeah, yeah. That's going to be real. It'll be really interesting. I think that we are in a... What did it? What did? What did Jay Powell say? We are flying by the stars and sailing by the moon. I don't know. I'll have that quote ready um, in the in the notes. <laughs> but uh, we're we're no no we're sailing under we're navigating by the stars under cloudy skies. And uh, they that, they said that in like 2022. And I think that the, the skies have cleared up a little bit, but it's it, it's making me nervous. I can see something on the horizon that I don't like, <laughs> and I hope that that, that it's just. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's just a passing thing. Um, but I, I'm, I'm just – my worries have not eliminated yet. Um, however, like I, I remember – and this was a uh, – this is actually a comment from Paul Fiorella, who is a friend of, of The Great Report, has been on here a couple of times. And it was about the economy, and he was noting, rightly, economists were predicting a recession for the past two years. Yes, a recession is always going to occur, but they were wrong. And 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 those pre- people that predicted a recession in like 2022 or 2023, um, they may be sitting pretty right now and be like, well, yeah, but it's going to come. Well, you're like, yeah, I know I was wrong, but it's going to come. It's like, yeah, but you were wrong. And that's millions of dollars that, that that people may have bet on or may not have bet on if they were really trusting. I think the one thing I would counter that with, though, specifically, is we've always known that the indicator of the recession is because we've been inverted the on the curve. yield curve for two years. And yeah. I think that I if I'm projecting on what they're thinking. No, that's, this, that was what it was as about. As yeah. it uninverts, we know that we're going into it. Yeah. And I think it just took longer to uninvert mm-hmm. than what people thought. Yeah. And I think that's where it is. Because I think, I don't think they're wrong. Every time we've seen them uninvert, like history has shown us every time it's uninverted, we've gotten a recession. Yeah. And so I think that's what they're saying. But I do agree that it was two years that we were inverted, where usually it's a much shorter cycle of being inverted. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I agree that it's like something is extended and I don't know whether, yeah, whether the pain is going to be extended now, whether it, like if it's unemployment or, or, or whatever. However, I do think that the investment prospects could be, uh, could be really good. Um, now this is just leading into this CBRE article here. Now I will bring it up if I have my fancy little switcher here. We're going to talk about this CBR who says, who asks what could be in store for commercial real estate. Um, this is a really brief article, but I think it makes a really powerful point. Um, essentially, the start of a rate cut is a good time to invest in commercial real estate. Um, I think that the brevity of this note it has, uh, I think that that uh there's quality there behind it <laughs> I, and and there's a really good chart here that shows uh several rate the start of several rate cut uh cycles so whether it's q2 2019 um or q1 1981 if you invested in commercial real estate at the beginning of those rate cycles uh rate cut cycles then chances are you'd be um you'd be doing pretty well um now i think that uh if you look instead at these other two moments in um, what did they say? The exceptions here was a great financial crisis in 2007 and the savings and loan crisis in um, in 1989. Um, however, we've uh, all those other all those other moments. It's it's been pretty great. Now the chart here shows if you invested what your 12 month return. That's what you got. 12 quarter return. Sorry, so that's three years, and then what the two year return would be and then what the one year return would be. Um, and it measures, you know, usually the 12 month, uh, the, the what is it? Three year return is always going to be better. However, in those exception years, it was the one year returns that were the best. And, uh, and things took a real nosedive during the uh, great financial crisis. I think that that is a suitable exception. I don't know enough about the savings and loan crisis. That was before my time, <laughs> but, um, but the, but the great financial crisis, that's a, that it's not like that is an exception just because it's an exception. We just throw it out. It's like, no, we all knew what was going on. That was very much rooted in in mortgages and in, in real estate. Um, specifically, I think a lot of it was probably single family homes. But it's not to say that the commercial real estate was unaffected, too, um, given the you know the stress that the bank the banks were under and um, the widespread effects of that as a financial crisis. Um I, I also think that, um, like, I may have understated, overstated things, sorry, when I said that the beginning of a rate cut cycle would bring more intense investor interest. I, I, I made this point maybe last week or the week before how, you know, yeah, with Powell cutting rates, and I think I even talked about it with you, it could, it could lead to some kind of initial rush and some fervor. I don't know if we've seen that. Um, and I think that it's probably a, a safer bet to, to, to think of, you know, the excitement's going to come when the numbers make sense for everyone. I think the excitement's going to come when the deals are available. Yeah, yeah. Because one thing that we're seeing specifically in our work, and I, I'm speaking specifically on apartments, not necessarily on some of the rate cuts as the economy as a whole and where money is flowing through to, but a lot of people have bought deals, I would say, in the last five to 10 years. Mm-hmm. And I mean, there's obviously a huge amount of people who bought in 2021, 2022. Yeah. And... Some people are in trouble with those properties. Some people are doing fine with those properties. But 
no one under their own free will is going to sell a property they bought in 2021 or 2022 right now and get any sort of return. Yep. And so anyone that's going to be selling those properties is going to be forced to because they're not looking good. So I think that's going to affect kind of what you're seeing there. But... Or but the or then the people that are selling are they're not the ones that bought in twenty twenty they're the ones that held it they held for, it for a long, long time longer. yeah if they're not going to get a good return on it why sell yeah because if yeah. you bought it prior if you bought a deal prior to twenty twenty unless you put some really bad debt on it mm-hmm. in the interim you're in good shape like yeah. there yeah. there's no reason to have to sell even if you were to refinance and it's a higher interest rate given what you probably bought the deal for. 2018 2019 i mean if you're on 10 yeah. year debt right now and you bought it in 2014 or 2015 you're probably in pretty good shape yeah yeah there's no real incentive and to... so there's no incentive and yeah. so the reason we haven't seen the money flow through is because deals of quality aren't for sale mm-hmm. i mean there there are some new construction deals that are coming out so yep. that's probably the one exception but a good five to ten year old asset no one that owns those is sell it, are selling those. People that are selling stuff right now are people that got in a bind are trying to do a value add on a 1960s, yeah. 1970s deal. It's not pe- selling out. They want to get rid of it. But that's not a deal. Yeah. And that's not a place that people want to put money. I, I, I look at the old Warren Buffett quote of, or maybe it was Munger, one of the two of them of, buy a good company for a fair price mm-hmm. rather than a fair company for a great price. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. No, and... That being said, I do think that there is – so it's it's like there's this amount of like risk and fear. Um, like right now, we're not seeing – yes, we're not seeing the deals. Um, so not seeing people come into the market as, as sellers. But um, there's also I think a slightly lower investment interest I think than I, than I was – than I was uh, – anticipating like i don't know in in the deals that you are pursuing are the are the bids going up and up and up for for quality deals they are yeah. and that's that's where it is <laughs> is there's there's just few enough of those that those deals are getting very very competitive okay okay now uh a deal that maybe got really competitive because it was a lower point of entry in 2021 2022 where it's like hey the people that are raising capital the people that maybe it's one of their early on in their deals and hey i just i'm gonna go after anything i can get and i'll pay up a little bit for it so i can get in the game yeah those deals aren't those deals aren't going yeah right right now okay those those deals are much more reserved much more moderated much more in kind of a early like pre-2019 cycle and investment risk profile but a a new new construction class a deal is going very very high right now okay because that's interesting that's, it's it's a everyone has seen and seen the pains of having to do the value adds and all that yeah and so the risk adjusted return right now is swung heavily towards those class a deals hmm. very interesting because that's what i was that's what i was thinking kind of about so if if this chart if these charts here were correct and that you know the investment um the investments were really it was it was most promising during like uh, at the beginning of a rate cut cycle. That also that that also assumes that there's slightly less investment interest. Uh, it's kind of predicated upon a lower level of investment interest in these early cycle moments compared to later cycles. And I think I think one thing you'll see too is I think the size of the investment has it matters significantly too. And I, I've had a lot of conversations with brokers, and I think there's a sweet spot for people, um, which maybe five to ten years ago was kind of that. 25 to 35 million dollar deal mm-hmm. call it 250 units when you buy it it's call it 120 to 130 yeah. or I, that was kind of the sweet spot for a number of years well that, that well so what and what kind of project was it value add it was kind of like years a, old i would say 10 to 15 years old okay. maybe it was a like light lipstick kind of update okay. appliance stuff like that maybe it was just you buy the deal and operate it and get some yield a uh, mm-hmm. little bit different investment profile probably five to ten years ago versus what we're seeing in the last five years yeah yeah so you kind of saw that now all of a sudden those same deals that are 250 units are now instead of 25 to 35 million dollars mm-hmm. those deals are now 45 to 60 million dollars okay and even though like everything has kind of gone up in value going and finding enough people to write that that check is is still significantly more difficult because even though like all things equal and the value of it has gone up because of mortgages being call it 65 to 70 percent of the loan value yeah and people were able to lever it during those times probably closer to 70 yeah. percent all of a sudden now you're raising money on 
call it 30 to 35 percent if you want to include your deal costs on mm-hmm. 35 million dollars so you're looking at that kind of call it nine to 12 million dollars of raising capital yeah that same deal today is over 20 million dollars of capital that you have to raise man that's crazy so because of the higher interest rates the higher valuations and the um and the high, the lower loan to value, you're just you just have to work a whole lot harder to raise a to raise money for the same building. Exactly. Wow, that's depressing. <laughs> well, but that's that's kind of what I wanted to, to to talk about here is is this time at the beginning of a rate cut cycle, it, it is scary, and the reason why, and the reason why um, it may you know. It may look scary is because is because there's this yeah the risk return profile and and if if the returns look this good like we see in the you know we see in this chart then um then there, it probably was a great deal of risk at the at the start of those cycles and it's going to be a great deal of risk and I think the hard that's a hard part to quantify because I've underwritten a number of deals and worked with Spencer on stuff that yeah. it's like that deal looks like good I know the basis I know what I know what that costs I know what it would cost to replace it. Mm-hmm. But there is absolutely nothing I can put on paper in an underwriting that yeah. would an investor would believe, even though I know it's probably going to perform this way just mm-hmm. because of, like you said, historical precedent when we come out of these kind of cycles. But if I were to put how I really think it's going to be, I mean, there was one deal we were looking at where there was a there were probably six deals that were being built in a two two mile okay. radius of each other. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, kind of sub market demographics, um, a lot of job growth in the area, mm-hmm. but it's going to be it's going to look really rough for about two years because they have to absorb yeah. all that supply. But it's probably once that supply is gone, mm-hmm. the jobs there because it's in an area that's doing thousands of jobs yeah. of yeah. like um, industrial and like kind of the onshoring manufacturing. Meta was in the area. Yeah. All of a sudden, there's not going to be any deliveries, and so you're probably going to see twelve to fifteen percent rent growth. Because yeah. all of that's going to be absorbed. There's not going to be anywhere for these people to live. All of those jobs will now be created. Mm. But if I were to place somewhere and I were to put on paper, hey, Spencer, we're going to see 3% rent growth, maybe 3 to 4% rent growth year two. But I think we're going to see 12% rent growth year three. Yep. It, no one would believe us. Yeah. Because yep. we're not doing anything to force that. We're not doing anything to create that. It's not like we're doing a value add. It's not like we're doing mm-hmm. anything like that. We're just like, say, sticking our finger up in there. We think that's what's going to happen. And I, I think that there's a lot of background information to back that up. But it's really hard to go to people and say, "Hey, I need twenty million dollars on this investment." Thesis. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good that's a good response to. I was I had this whole thing written, <laughs> I had this whole thing written about like, oh, think of all those deals that you passed on, and and you know that pit in your stomach, Pepto Bismol is not going to help it. You know, you gotta you gotta bite, you gotta take your bite when you can. But uh, but I think that as a you know, as an acquisition, if you're in acquisition, you're always you're always also thinking about, well, are investors going to be able to swallow this? Yeah. And I think that's the hard part is there are a lot of deals. I, there are probably five deals right now that I would love to go buy. If mm-hmm. I had a check and I had my money, I yeah, would yeah. love to go buy and I would double down and I would go hard. Mm-hmm. But I if I were to put on paper what is realistic that someone would understand based off of kind of that's invested in these type of deals before and understands like what the market conditions are, they would look at the assumptions and be like, that makes sense. But you're giving me like a 10% return yeah, over the yeah. lifetime of this deal. And if I took, put in there what I actually thought was going to happen, it's kind of your normal metrics. But then all of a sudden you're getting up there on the risk spectrum yep. because you're making a lot of assumptions. And then all of a sudden that that return is kind of the, our return threshold for like a normal right down the ballpark. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. I actually if, yeah. need a couple percentage points more for the risk and the uncertainty. Yep. No, no, that's a good point. When your when your risk isn't like a positive, you got to have your baseline be set up and have the risk be be positive. You can't let the baseline be negative and your risk be normal. Um, but yeah, that's that. It, it's going to be such an interesting moment, and I'm hoping I'm really pretty confident that investor appetite is going to improve as these as the numbers look better from like the interest rate side. Um, however, like I think that some people could, could bid up right now. And make some real good deals, and just because the moment right now and the T twelves that they're looking back on didn't show great great rent growth, um, but they're really confident that things are going to move positive in the future. And and I and I would agree. I think that uh, that I would not be the only one thinking that. 
And um, I, I think that strong apartment demand persists in third quarter as supply hits a 50-year high. So yes, we may have had sluggish rent growth. And there's going to be an article that I'm going to cover here from Apartment List that's a, a strong counterpoint to this. But there is reasons to be optimistic about the multifamily market. Um, the multifamily market may be running more smoothly than that transition that I just try to manage. Uh, the chart of the day here, and I think it's really illustrative um, is this the gap between supply and demand continues to close is the title of the chart and it tracks the annual supply the annual demand and the difference between the two all in one handy chart um, what i want to call out here is yes sure supply is going off the charts you see this in the it's represented by a series of of light green horizontal or of light green vertical bars and um that's great. I love it. A um, lot of supply. It's pushing rents down. It's making it easier for renters. Um, but it, it did cause the lower rent growth that we saw for the past two years. Um, the big point here, and this is why I wanted to highlight this I highlight this chart, is that the demand is coming up to mean it. And the gap between supply and demand is closing not because they are building or delivering less apartments, rather. The gap is closing because demand is is coming back in such a big way. Demand was negative, it looks like, for in, in like... Uh, in early 2023, late 2022, um, but it has steadily increased into um, into 2023 and in 2024, where right now, man, it is it is almost equal to supply and almost equal to this record 50 year record of supply. So we're really we're really doing well if you're thinking if you want to think of demand as more lasting and consistent as apartment supply. And I would argue that that's probably true, considering that. Um, all the trends and all of the indicators of uh, of apartment construction, apartment supply, they're all pointing to, all right, things are going to slow down. Um, and, and I yeah. think that's important because the deals that I'm referencing right now, mm -hmm. lot, almost all of them are new construction deals. And I think that rent growth is really hurting a lot of those developers because they underwrote rent kind of mimicking what you're seeing. But all of a sudden, kind of with the supply, a lot of people saw it, a lot of people went in and you had some kind of maybe not so good rent growth. And so one of the things that's really difficult for me on the acquisition side mm -hmm. is I kind of see that in these offerings of deals that are almost stabilized. Maybe they're just stabilized, but had to do concessions. Everyone yeah. knows that on like a lease up, almost every lease up you ever do, you have to give some sort of yeah. concessions. Yeah. Um, but a lot of times maybe you can keep your rents or maybe your rents are further than what they originally were going to be. But what we're seeing on these deals is it costs these developers, call it 200, $220 a door, thousand dollars a door to build these deals mm. the financials are only showing that maybe it's like on a worth buying right now at yeah 190 195 door so they're not going to sell it for a loss so the income that they're so the income they're pulling because they're giving away so much free concessions etc cetera, etc cetera, they've had to lower rent yeah yeah that they're it's only maybe valued from an income standpoint at like call it $190,000 a door. Okay. Okay. But they're never going to sell for less than what they're buying for. They're trying to get that 230, 240 so that they can make some money. Yeah. Um. And so if I want that deal, buying it at 230 in 10 years is probably a really good, really good assumption. Mm -hmm. But buying it today, I need it at 190. And how do I, how do I tell the story of making up the difference there? Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, uh, I, I do want to know, uh, yeah, like as another indicator here of the, um, of the construction. So right now we are maybe at peak deliveries. I'm not sure, you know, it depends on what source you're using, whether we're at the peak or just past the peak, but this peak is finite. Um, and I, I want to, you know, July, 2023 is, is really the month to, to look at. That is when we did see the peak, um, where is it? I'm going to try to highlight it uh, with my cursor here. Yeah. 1,004,000 units were under construction at that moment in July 2023. Just over a million. So we're down to only 850,000 now. <laughs> that's uh, that's a only in quotation marks. <laughs> Pre-pandemic, we had about 600,000. Maybe, you know, a little a little above, a little below. But man, it was a from between basically August 2016 until March 2019. It was it was spot on, like 600,000 apartment units were built um, at any given moment or, or, or uh, under construction at any given moment. And if I were projecting where yeah. I think it'll level out to, I think it will level out below that just because of costs. And yeah. I was talking, costs are coming down. 
but I I don't think that anyone, especially with kind of the tightenings at the bank right now, mm-hmm. I don't know that anyone is going to push through and get real aggressive when we don't have that red discovery yet. And so I yeah. would say, I think for a couple of years, you said think, you think it's going to go below the 600. I think it's going to go below the 600. All right. Now I think it yeah. will recover back more than that, mm-hmm. but I think because of starts and the ability for people to be able to start projects and assume rent growth and have the banks on board and to get returns, like the, we had kind of the perfect storm of, we had lower rates and interest rates. Uh, if you pull yep. that uh, back up yeah, yeah. where, call it we were in the call it two percent range mm-hmm. um over your spread so like call it a five to six to seven percent interest rate on a construction loan yeah right now we're like eight to nine percent and so it's you're paying for a lot of money for yeah. not a lot of certainty on the back end so all of a sudden then your bank with the, your bank loan is going to be 50 percent loan to value not 60 70 percent loan to value yeah and so it's a lot harder to take that risk Okay. And so because that risk isn't there, because we don't have the discovery yet on where rents are going to get to after the stabilization, I just think the starts are going to be there. Now, once we get that rent growth and the st- people are able to start making those more concrete bets, I think that it will start to ramp back up. Yeah. But I would say in the short term, because people can't start because of debt, the rent discovery is not there. I just... I see that number dropping probably below the 2016 number, maybe mm-hmm. not significantly below, and I could be wrong. Yeah, yeah. But I just I think that the economic conditions are so much harder right now than even they were then to get those deals started. Yeah, I agree. That that's something it, that it's really do. hard to see people delivering that much. Yeah. with the uncertainty we have right now, knowing that those are two year out projects. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I did think like maybe we could. We could level off at like instead of six hundred at six fifty, where where it seemed to be kind of, but that but that was in the moments that were like, those right were after. those were a lot better economic, and it was a lot yeah. easier to get loans to yeah. start the construction at those times. And I think yeah. I think that's what it is. I don't think it's the demand is not there. I think that it's the ability to get financing to start the deals. the The finance side of that is still so out of whack that I don't think people are going to be able to put the risk capital on it to be able to start that. No, and people really will still do it. But there's not going to be the volume of people doing it. Yeah. All right. No, that's that's really good. Um, I I had a, so it 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 would be interesting to see how uh, how this shakes out in terms of like how attenuated the um, the the construction times are going to be. So uh, that was that was one refrain that we kept hearing during the during the pandemic was these projects are getting longer and longer. Um, I I still think that we're going to fall off, and like I think that we're we're yeah, we may be working on the backlog of projects that were complete that were started during the pandemic, but um, but the but that's kind of quickly getting resolved too. So it'll be it'll be really interesting, I think, to see. And sure, um, each market is going to be different, um, but I think largely we'll see a lot less maybe in the Sun Belt. I think that a lot of the construction that was happening is was in the Sun Belt in in especially like the most the really populous centers there that really shifted. Um, I know you know we were looking at markets and and. It, it really is overweighted how much building they did in the Sun Belt compared to the rest of the the rest of the country. So and I see different but I think, different places. I think it depends on how migration of the com- yeah, country yeah. moves as well, because a lot of people have moved to Florida, to the Carolinas, to Georgia, to all of those areas. If they stay there, then yeah, maybe maybe it absorbs. But like, look at Florida right now mm-hmm. with the number of hurricanes that have hit. How many people can afford to live in Florida with insurance premiums where they are? And then all of a sudden, what it, what does the equilibrium do? Because obviously, if people can't afford to pay insurance on their house, that makes, hey, maybe I'm going to rent. But then all of a sudden, those interest, insurance costs go to I know. apartments like, as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've looked at deals in the Sun Belt before, and it's almost $4,000 a unit in yeah. insurance. Well, if you're going to pass that on to uh, someone that's living at your community, I mean, you break that up over monthly portion of their rent. That means that these people are paying three to four hundred dollars per month just to you in insurance. I know. I would. I that's I, with these hurricanes that hit just one after the other. You know, I was thinking about. I was thinking about that years ago, uh, or maybe a year and a year or so ago. With there was another hurricane. <laughs> you know, there's always hurricanes that are happening, and it was getting to the point where you know, is insurance just gonna? Are you gonna have to fund 
like the rebuilding of the house every year. You know, it, it, it's I know that that's like kind of overkill, but that's but that's kind of where we're getting is that like the, these insurance costs are going up so much. It's beginning to have a material effect on whether people can afford to live there. Or not. Yeah. And I mean, I talked to I my renewal on my personal insurance yeah. company when I talked to my my broker on that and he was like, it's it's going to be different, too, because you have some people who just don't have any exposure to that. So, like, yeah, he's like who you currently have your insurance with. They're regional. They don't have exposure to Florida. Yeah, they don't have yeah. exposure to that. But obviously, they're pretty concentrated here. And so if there is an event in the Midwest, like it's going to hit you right now. There hasn't been. But like, yeah, we didn't expect anything to be in the mountains of North Carolina either. And yeah. So I'm sure there were some insurance companies that took some pretty heavy bets there, not thinking there was a ton of risk. And then look at what's happened. Yeah, yeah. No, very good point. Um, I just want to cover some of these top line numbers from RealPage before we move on to some similar numbers, um, but different framing from apartment lists. Now, they uh, uh, RealPage did follow the same kind of thing that I they tried to signal here talking about CPI. Monthly effective rent change in the apartment industry is 0.5% for market rate apartments as reported by RealPage. Um, rents grew year over year by 0.2%. So we're still around that zero. And I think that by the end of the year, we could be at zero or in the negative for um, rents overall. But if you look at the regional rent change, this is where I said, like, man, the weight of these uh, of, of rent growth of, of apartment inventory is so much in the South right now, because the South is the only one that is in the negative at negative 1.4% year over year rent growth, where everyone else, you know, Northeast, it's 2.6% rent growth, Midwest is 2.9% rent growth, and West is 0.2% rent growth. But overall, we have 0.2. So that South uh, the the rent the negative rent growth in the south has drugged down has dragged down the rent growth so much there it's till it's almost zero so uh, so that's really uh, really interesting really worth worth noting the the real effects and, and how much the the southern sunbelt markets really move things nationwide um, they do have they've got occupancy numbers by region looks like the northeast is leading with occupancy at ninety five point eight where midwest is second at ninety five the south is at the is in last place here at, at a still healthy actually 93.4 percent and then the west at 94.8 percent um we are growing by 2.8 percent in terms of the annual inventory um i think that uh that again like what we said the you know, measuring the apartment construction trends, this is going to, the market's going to look so much different, I think, next year. I think that, yes, sure, apartment construction times are longer and things are things move more slowly um, than you expected and they always move more slowly than I expected. <laughs> but um, I think that we're really near a, a pretty decent sized inflection point when it comes to apartment deliveries. And um, I think that the demand is going to continue and, and make, and it, it makes me pretty confident for rent growth uh, this uh, this coming year however like 2024 is probably going to end up looking a lot like 2023 2025 <laughs> maybe this is what i'll say is next year but anyways 2025 is really going to is, is going to be different because we see the different um the different supply landscape and i think that also lower interest rates is hopefully going to have a larger economic effect, not just in our jobs and in getting mortgages for apartment buildings or getting mortgages for a home, um, for a single family home, but like even outside of, uh, in, even outside of like housing, it will help to spur the economy. And that could, that could generate stronger employment, could generate higher, uh, higher incomes, could generate higher rents, um, uh, you know, and, and increase housing demand in that way. So, um, that's my that's my kind of sunny take on it. Now there is a little bit more of a I would I guess I would I guess I should say realistic take, um, but it is a different take from apartment list. Their um, their assessment here and I've got the um, here, let's just expand that a little bit. All right, their assessment is that um, that things probably will be worse next year or or at least as similarly sluggish this year. Uh, 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 this year and and next year, um, we're we're now two months past peak le leasing season, and it's monthly reports like these I think from apartment list that are going to be crucial signals for apartment performance in the next six months. I say six months, I don't say a year, but I do think that the next six months are going to be um, are going to be kind of challenged. Uh, they're not going to you're not going to see huge income growth. Now, I, I think that probably maybe maybe not six months, maybe it's four months, but whatever um, in the winter of this year and then the winter of, you know, of early 2025, you're not going to see strong rent growth because of um, 
because we're still dealing, we're still going to see this tail end of elevating apartment deliveries and apartment demand has not yet surpassed it and and probably likely won't given the seasonal effects of the apartment market. And the seasonal effects, and I think there's twofold when we mm-hmm. talked about the deliveries of that. And I said, I think the one thing that may prove me wrong specifically on yeah. the number of units that are under construction as well is the time delivery of them. Because oh, what's happened okay. is a lot of the, because of supply chain issues, a lot of these um, complexes were delayed, call it six months, call it eight months because of things that need to be delivered to complete the mm-hmm. construction of this. Something that delivers in May is going to have a lot di- different look at Lisa profile than something mm. that delivers in like November. Well, do they always aim for you, to deliver in the peak? You want to deliver as close to peak leasing season okay. as possible. Yeah. Maybe the tail end to like maybe February or something like that. Cause if there are delays, then there, you have yep, a little yep, bit yep. of offset. But if you're delivering in November, you're going to be you're going to be stuck for yeah. a while. Mm-hmm. And so what that's going to do is that's going to affect your leasing season next year and not just yours, but then the people around you. Because if you're just trying to get leased up and you're giving away the farm during oh, yeah. leasing yeah. season, all of a sudden, everyone around you has to react to that. So mm-hmm. if some of those um, like deliveries are being delayed and are like, maybe they're delivering now, maybe they're delivering next year and they're supposed to be a March delivery next year, but they get delivered in October. Yeah. That could drag that cycle down for a little bit longer, which is why I might tend to agree with this apartment list that we may see it for a little bit longer mm-hmm. because I think those deliveries are going to struggle based off of when they are doing leased up. And I think people are going to give away the farm in order to get them leased up and to try to get okay. some sort of financing on them. And that's why I think that you may see some softening for another year. Yeah, so I think it, and that's going to be market specific. I, okay. There are going to be lots of places that are going to be fine, but I think some of your heavy, heavy delivery so markets. Like, so if you're delivering during like the down, the winter season or, or the late fall or whatever, you, you kind of soften the market a little more so that you're entering peak leasing season at a lower point than then you would already if exactly. Everybody. Okay. Okay. That's, that's really interesting. Now, now the specific numbers from apartment list is um, a month over month decrease by 0.5 percent. Now, I think that that was about the same as as real page. However, their overall numbers for rent growth are ne- are negative 0.7 percent. Um, this is very notable. So this chart here that we're looking at, it, it tracks decreasing rents from essentially mid 2023 until now. Um, that's over a year and maybe a year and a quarter of, of negative rent growth. And I think that this this chart here, um, where it just shows the nominal rent growth period, that um, to me, that is the most, uh, again, illustrative. <laughs> it illustrates this transition that we had after peak rent growth in mid-2022. We, have, we got about two years, so we came off the peak, and it has steadily gone down. Um, so mid 2022 to mid 2024 and after the general trend, and you can look at this, you know, I, I encourage listeners to to look at this apartment list report, or um, I'm going to make this full screen for the viewers and just to show um, just to show how, yeah, it doesn't, it's, it's bouncing back and down every, every spring it goes, the, the rents go up every winter, it goes down, but the downs were stronger than the ups. And that's been the case for the past two years. It is because of apartment supply. Uh, like we said, it's not because of apartment demand and those conditions are going to change. However, it's worth a huge reminder that this is what we've been dealing with in terms of income for apartments for the past two years. Yes, there's consola- consolations in that, uh, in that, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, rents were super high and, 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 and apartment owners and investors are probably still making money from that, and that's that's great if you do the books. But but a lot of people, if they're if if they're buying and selling, you know, any time after that, that's a huge challenge. So for the so if you bought an apartment at any of the from, uh, especially if you bought it in mid twenty twenty two, you're having a tough time now because apartment rents are probably lower now than they were then. And so I think that's, I think yeah. that's market by market. Um, yeah, yeah, and I w- I would say. Let's go. Um, I'll, I'll counter that because I will yeah. say the the deals that we bought in mid 2022, both of the ones that we bought in May and June of 2022, we are actually significantly up on okay on rent there, there compared to where we were at those times. Mm-hmm. Um, no. Now I would say, but those are in two markets that don't necessarily have the supply yeah, coming yeah. online that some other markets do, and so I do think that that is specifically going to be. So not every not every single market has has had has lower rent growth 
now than they did in mid 2022. Well, even even your nominal amount, like mm-hmm. what I'd say is like what's your average nominal rent, but I would say in the areas we've been fortunate enough, the couple deals that we bought in those markets are yeah some of the ones that are in there. Your red was the fastest yeah your, yeah your rent growth. So we we were fortunate on some of those that we did. But I would say even when you look at that nominal amount, the nominal amount's going down. But what if the nominal amount is going down, but inflation's going up? What does that tell you? That's bad. <laughs> well, it's bad for apartments. Yeah. But- for consumers, that means consumer wages are growing up. Yeah, yeah. So the rent is a lower percentage of their gross income that they're bringing in. Yeah, that's which means well, that's good for them. The, yeah, yeah, for good for them. But then on the back end, as we get out of the cycle, and to your point earlier on interest rates and what happens with those cycles, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden, if we're growing rents, all of a sudden rents aren't outpacing the percentage of income, and so if rents do go up, people are still able to afford those. Okay. Okay. And so I think I think that there are opportunities within it that people are still going to be filler. It's not yeah, like we're yeah. going to be raising rent so where people can't afford it. If people's wages are going up, but rent is staying the same, that means there's margin in there for people to be able to pay more rent. I think why the reason we're seeing part of the reason we're seeing it kind of level out as well mm-hmm. is I think people got too aggressive with raising rents in 2022. I I, I would and, kind of agree with that. <laughs> and, and the reason I say that is ask anyone in this business mm-hmm. what their bad debt looks like now compared to where it did in 2021. Oh. And so people are- It's, natu- higher, it's are, higher now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> people are naturally calibrating that maybe everyone was like, oh, well, there's all this stimulus. So bad debt is people missing their rent payments? Exactly. Okay. And so what happened is people raised this rent and because you had all the stimulus check in 2020 and 2021. So they raised rents because people could afford it. Mm-hmm. These people moved in because they could afford it. Then all of a sudden, typically you don't recertify every renewal for people. Like, hey, bring in your income and make sure you can still afford to live here. You typically just renew them. And people were renewing. Well, I don't can't go anywhere else because it's just as expensive down the street. So I'm just going to renew here, even though yeah. I can't pay for it. And so what you saw is a lot of people that weren't able to make those payments. And so as a reaction, what people did is they brought their rents back down to where people can actually afford to pay for their rents. Again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think that you see that in actually, and and they don't. So I will say the conclusion of this article from, um, from apartment list is, is really worth, worth noting here. And they do say that, um, Recent signs of labor market softness could dampen demand going forward. With this in mind, we expect that new supply will continue to outstrip demand into 2025. And I think that the assumption there would be rent growth would continue um, to be either sluggish or or not growing at the typical like 3.5 percent that we that we noted earlier in in the episode. However. I think that there's a lot more reasons to be optimistic, and that's something that was noted in the real page one about you know how much apartment demand has gone up, and it is noted too in this apartment list report about strong demand stabilizing occupancy rates, and that's what I wanted. That's that's what I was thinking about with the uh, <laughs> with this uh, apartment list report. Now they have a uh, the their vacancy index, and they are they're comparing now until. July 2020, which was a previous peak of occupancy, it has been 6.7 for the past several months. It really hasn't changed. And every time I I review the vacancy numbers from apartment list, I'm like, it sure does seem like we are at the crest of like a large hill. Not we're not spiking forward, we're not growing anymore. And there's a lot of a lot of signs that maybe this vacancy could start to decrease, where occupancy could get a little bit more healthy. And I think that um, that the rent growth movements is supports that idea, maybe. Um, however, you know, rhetorically, I, um, Yardy Matrix is making the same point. They're not saying, oh, look at and look at vacancy. It's so high. It's they're they're more saying, no, no, actually, the, the demand and the absorption and the occupancy is now stabilizing, um, whereas before it was steadily increasing, maybe a little bit more worrisome for owners and investors. Um, however, <laughs> they are recording very similar rent growth numbers. Um, year over year rent growth was is 0.9% for Yardy Matrix, and the month over month rent growth uh, was negative by 0.2%. So um, what is it? Real page, negative 0.5%. Uh, Yardy, Yardy Matrix, negative 0.2%. And apartment list a negative 0.5 percent. All of those, you know, a little below one, and they're likely to continue uh, to continue in those negative, uh, in the, continue those negative trends through the winter, um, barring some kind of crazy black swan 
Um, and now it's, I just want to go over some of these month over month leaders. We've got Indianapolis leading for month over month rent growth at, um, at just under 1% and, um, Followed by New York City, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Baltimore, Detroit, Kansas City, New Jersey, Columbus, and Orlando. Those are the ones that are, you know, the most obviously uh, in the positive here. Um, worth noting here, outside of, uh, are there any Sun Belts? The only Sun Belt, the only Sun Belt market here is Orlando with with positive month over month rent growth. The rest are either at zero or barely, or just like barely positive or barely negative. I can't even. I can't even tell if Atlanta or Phoenix are at zero or a that's little gotta, positive or a little negative. That's got to be unchanged. Yeah, it's yeah, be zero. Yeah, but uh, but anyways, um, it is it, it, these Midwestern markets I, are are the ones that that continue to be these kind of stable leaders. Now, if we cross back over into the year over year, we're seeing a little bit of the same story. So it's not like there has been a recent change in um, in the regional differences for rent growth. And I can't help but think that this is a product of the enormous amount of building um, apartment construction that has happened in the Sun Belt. So New York City is leading for year, year over year rent growth, followed by Kansas City, Boston, Indianapolis, Washington, D.C., Detroit, Columbus, New Jersey. I'm going to stop. I would. Have, OK, I'm not going to stop. <laughs> I, w- I was going to stop when I got to a Sunbelt market, but that would have left me naming a bunch of markets until I got to like Miami or something. Um, but needless to say, none of the uh, markets in the top 10 for year over year rent growth are um, are Sunbelt markets. So it's really, you know, the Northeast and the Midwest that are growing the, mo- the most with a few Western markets and a few of them that are that were uh, frankly due for rent growth. I remember Portland and Seattle as a. Uh, as really suffering during the pandemic where when everyone else was was growing like gangbusters and then same thing for like san francisco which it's doing well month over month but man it's it has been hammered and it may be now let's go back to the apartment list map it may be one of the few markets that has like never changed since uh since the beginning of the uh since the beginning of the pandemic. So it, it, it like just has not gotten better um, in terms of rents. Now, that can be a good thing or a bad thing if you're a renter. Um, I, do, I just think that it's, it's, it's been fairly stagnant in terms of rent growth. I think it's a reaction of the high home prices there um, on an absolute level. But that's, uh, that's it. I, I want to cover one last thing here. So we can move away from the, the, the multifamily market. We've got this uh, pretty good image of it. And just as a, this is one kind of last note here, um, the home purchase sentiment at index it, it, it tracks feelings. It's some of my favorite surveys are about sentiment, <laughs> um, but these feelings are are getting a little bit better, and um, and and notably so. I think it's it's tracking you know maybe the first of a couple months of improving sentiment. It increased by one point eight points to seventy three point nine points in September. I I think that this number um, is promising in that you know let's look at the, if you look at the constituent. So this feelings index is a combination of feelings about a bunch of different things buying conditions selling conditions home price outlook mortgage rate outlook job loss concern and change in household income um for a lot of those they went up except for buying conditions (laughs) buying conditions is a net negative 62 percent uh so 60 so you know 62 percent think it's a bad time actually 81% 81% think it's a bad time to buy, 19% think it's a good time to buy, and um, things got a little bit more positive, but uh, but we're still way underwater. Well, it, we're still way underwater, and I think that's a hard, I think that's what's hard on here. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. it's a good time to sell. Well, if you sell, what what are you changing into? Are you selling because you're moving, for yeah, junk, yeah. which is a moving out of necessity, or are you trying to find something better because... It's not a good time to sell if it's a bad time to buy and you have to buy on the other side of it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think some of this is like interest rates. So, yeah, it would be a lot better to buy. It's not just a product. Uh, this is this chart or this feeling of buying as bad is about interest rates as much as it is about the prices of a home. Um, it just makes me think, and, and again, like that home prices could go up even more. Um, I said at the top that home prices could shift downwards in the next in the next few months before going up just you know because of different environments with with, with interest rates and how you know it, st- it's still not perfect right like the interest rates don't make sense for anyone to refinance right now except if you just except if you just got caught on the wrong side of things um i've, I've been seeing some some articles some very I, I feel like they're trying to make the headline where they're talking about oh yeah cash out refinances are really popping off now it's like i don't think the 
I think that maybe later that could be true, but maybe they increased from 1% to 2% or something like that. Yeah. Um, but the, the real low point again was, um, is, is this idea that things are getting too expensive. Now I, I also want to go just to kind of scroll back up to the, to the chart in general, this is not the lowest of housing sentiment that there's been. Now this chart only starts in January of 2011. And you can imagine that that housing sentiment was lower then, and it was even probably lower in like 2010 and 29 and, two, uh, and, and 2008. Um, however, you know, at the same time, so if, if we look at to see the same home sentiment, it roughly tracks to around 2013, maybe, um, was it was when the home sentiment was similar to now pre pandemic, right? Um, and it's interesting just to compare those two moments, right? So in 2013, we were probably still hung over from the great financial crisis. We were learning, we were like adjusting to collapsed home values. There were people that say, oh yeah, it's a really bad investment to invest in a home. Why, why do that? Just rent. That was like the common, like uh, rule of thumb or like that was what, what, what people are saying. And, um, and now we're in this completely opposite to where the, the vibes are the same and speaks to the fact that home sentiment, there's a lot of different things that go into it. Just like you said, you know, it's not just home prices, it's interest rates. And, and again, it's not just the fact that they're high, it's the fact that they're low and their expectations of where of, of home values going up or down, I think are a big part of it. So the home, home price outlook here, 39% think they're going to, that home prices are going to go up 23% are going to go down. And that is a net change month over month of three percentage points. Now, year over year, that's three. It, it, has, it has gone down. So a year ago, people were a little bit more confident that home prices were going to go up. But it, but since then, and, and that totally makes sense. I think it has taken so long for the home buying market to... It, I, I, I get this sense that it is only like just now where interest rates are really kind of sinking in that okay we've got a we've got some work ahead of us the case shiller home price index showed a little dip um when interest rates first ran up in 2022 and but they've gone up since then i wonder if we're going to see a little dip before rates go down where it kind of sinks in where people can kind of make sense with the math of it and and we probably need like one or two more percent of of interest rate reductions before we get there i don't know so um, I think we can close it right there. I do think that there are some confident signs of housing demand, of even like in increasing home prices and multifamily price and rent growth. However, we're months away from that. Um, we're not years away from that. And there are clear signs that uh, that things are things are going to pop off in, in 2025. Uh, we just have to wait through the winter. Uh, it was a whole couple years of winter <laughs> in 22 and 23 and 24 probably. Um, but but there are signs, you know, there's there's some movement in interest rates, some real material things in the economy and in the, in the housing market in general that make this a really exciting time and a really exciting uh, place here on the Gray Report to track. So if you are interested in staying on top of the multifamily market, the housing and the economy, subscribe to the Gray Report newsletter at www.graycapitalllc.com slash newsletter and Follow the Gray Report podcast, subscribe to the Gray Capital YouTube channel, and keep and keep informed with the best information on the multifamily market, housing, and the economy. Thank you so much, Jay, for for pinch hitting and uh, and really this was excellent. And maybe you're gonna just replace me. So that, and that, and that would be fine. The show would be better. All right, thanks for having me on that. <laughs> thanks, guys.